we, uh, we I make that announcement so that if you have a problem with that, you can opt out. But we, we are recording now. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, middle of summer here, busy time, I'm sure, for everyone in this biz. Uh, my name is Dave Karen. Uh, I'm one of the co-hosts or tri-hosts. I never know what you call it when there are three of them. Um, and uh, this is uh, the quarterly meeting of the CC Hab uh, meeting. Uh, I'm going to uh, let Becky introduce herself before we get going. Just for everyone coming in, if you could please use the chat and add your name and affiliation in there so that we can capture attendance. And, uh, and if when you do come in, please uh, keep your microphone on mute so we don't have a lot of background noise, unless, of course, you're asking a question. Becky? Great. Good morning, all. My name is Becky Stanton. I am, as Dave mentioned, I am one of the CC Hub co-chairs. Um, Sarah Ryan couldn't make it today, um, but I have an update for her. And I'm with California Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. And thank you all for joining. So Sarah may be on late. She said she was going to try and, and join us late, but she did have something else that was, that was going on. Um, just so you know where we're headed, um, I will share my screen here, which you should have this, but has the agenda on it. If you can see that, hopefully you can. And um, we're going to talk a little bit. We'll do a little bit of introductions, announcements, and then we're going to have two presentations today, one by um, uh, Marissa Van Dyke, who's going to talk about the FHAB program. And then after the break, we'll have one by Ellen Priest, who's going to talk about uh, benthic source tracking. Uh, so that's, that's where we're headed. Um, for the top targets here, the, uh, the beginning, um, uh, the March meeting notes, the last quarterly meeting are now up on the web. If you go to the CC Hab webpage uh, under meetings, you'll find the agenda and the minutes from, from last time. Uh, so uh, I don't know if there are any comments, thoughts, questions about those. Becky, did you have anything to add on those? I would just also point out that there is the um, the recording. Um, so there's a link to the YouTube channel through the water quality monitoring page or council page. So that's also is available as well. Right, and those go up there pretty quickly. The, um, the recordings um, go to Nick, Nick puts them up uh, within a matter of hours usually. So within a day or so, certainly it's up there. Um, the other thing, I guess, um, Becky, you may want to say something about the HAB portal uh, itself. Um, yeah, we. Um, it's been a challenge um, just because of um, uh, IT uh, workload and just our capacity to manage keeping the HAB portal announcements page update. So. Um, we want to acknowledge that that is no, not current and recommend that people um, continue to look for things in the CC Hub listserv um, for current updates, but we are thinking we will keep that uh, live just as an, as an archive of, of past events that are, are relevant to HABs in California. So that is our plan. Um, we'll get that just acknowledged on that page relatively soon and um, just wanted to let people know that. Yeah, relatively soon is always one of those things. Um, Becky and I were just lamenting. It is difficult to get a lot of things done these days. Um, seems like uh, workforce in general is is hard, but um, we are working towards uh, trying to get the keep the web page uh, updated. The um, uh, text is easy, but of course, making anything completely accessible is a lot more work. Dave, can I do one more announcement? Absolutely, please. We, we have a little bit of time yet. So any if anyone has any announcements after Becky's, uh, please feel free to unmute and jump in. Just gonna acknowledge that um, myself and, and um, I was a co-author on and several others who were um, more primary authors. We just got a publication entitled The Synthesis of Ecotoxicology Studies on Cyanotoxins in Freshwater Habitats evaluating the basis for developing thresholds protective of aquatic life in the US. So mm -hmm. that's got evaluation of, of different thresholds in recreational water and a, a review of ecotoxicology uh, literature for cyanotoxins. So, and- Good um, Lord have mercy. I'm sorry, I know Jamie again? was gonna put the link in the- 
in the chat as well. Um, I think for right now we have like a 50 day free access. So if you're interested in the full text, please grab it soon. Otherwise I think it goes back to being a paid access for I think two years. So. All good. Other, other comments or announcements? We have a few minutes for sure. Just unmute and jump in. No, are we good? Okay, then I think we can move on. Maybe give Marissa a few more minutes here. Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. Uh, Marissa, I assume you would probably want to get through your, your presentation before questions or do you want people to up to you? Um, yeah, good question. So let's see here. Um, yeah, this is Marissa Van Dyke with the State Water Board. Um, yeah, I have uh, some material to go through, but um, I will take a pause um, before going to each kind of section of, of like kind of the meeting it, um, notes and uh, give you guys an opportunity to ask questions. So um, if you want to hold on to them or write them in the chat window, please do so. This is definitely for you. You guys content uh, really welcome feedback, questions, comments, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, let me just get things started and see how uh, is, okay. my, um, is my screen being shared. Then on on that note, um, I'll just repeat one more time. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're coming on, uh, please mute mute yourself, uh, especially if you're on a phone. We tend to get a lot of feedback from phones bouncing back and forth between phone and computer. So um, make sure you're on mute when you, when you come in. If you have not done so, please do sign in to the chat window, your name and your affiliation. That way we will catch attendance. It'd be much easier than trying to go through 50 something people that we have on the phone now. So with that said, um, Rissa, it's all yours. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Um, let me just get set up with my timer, keep track. When I'm going on too long. All right, one moment. All right, so it's always great to be able to um, address CC Hab folks. Um, and welcome to the meeting. And thanks for the opportunity, co-chairs, to be able to provide an update on the um, California Water Board's Freshwater and Estuarine Harmful Algal Bloom Program. We've got a new name as of uh, about two months ago. Um, I'll just kind of go over some material here. Uh, the co-chairs asked for an update. We haven't, um, the program hasn't done an update probably well over a year, maybe two years. Um, there's a lot of things that have been happening and changing, particularly the infrastructure of the program uh, with the legislative bill uh, that was <coughs> passed um, a little while back. Uh, we finally got the funding for um, monitoring projects, for contracting, and also to hire the first ever dedicated staff uh, that are full-time for the Harmful Algal Bloom program. Those of us have, who have spoken to you in the past, uh, Keith Bo McGregson, Ali Dunn, and I, over the past many years about this program at the water boards, we've been um, kind of like part-timers, that kind of thing. Um, so we have update on that, um, the monitoring strategy, legislative report. Also, we were asked to provide a little update on what kind of monitoring and special studies uh, the program is funding this year and up to next year as well. Um, including a little recap of the recent pre-holiday assessments um, that we've been doing. And this is the fourth year running of these assessments and uh, the first time we did a Memorial Day. So give a little recap on that. Um, and also what kind of efforts we're gonna be funding um, and working on in the first two years of our new program, particularly what things and um, like kind of resources will be developed that could be useful to CC Hab members, particularly you know remote sensing products and so forth, that kind of thing. One moment. All right. So again, when I um, I'll take breaks to answer questions, but feel free to put them in in the chat as well. <clears throat> so regarding program infrastructure, um, is for folks that are uh, new, maybe haven't heard from uh, the program in a while. So I want to give you a quick recap of where we come from. So the water boards is composed of the state water board in Sacramento and um, nine regional boards across the state. And, and together we're the water boards. The Harmful Algal Womb Program, which was launched in 2016, was um, is under uh, 
a program called SWAMP. Um, it's the Surface Water Ambient Monitoring Program at the Water Boards. And um, the Water Boards at that time was designated the lead agency to address um, response to um, incidents of freshwater HAB events, to assess them and communicate any relevant notifications and so forth. Um, Primarily, that pro this program has focused on recreational exposures and recreational waters, and it does overlap with drinking water uses and that kind of response when uh, there are blooms occurring also in source water. And uh, through the approval of the Assembly Bill 834, which established um, the Freshwater and Estuarine Harmful Algal Bloom Program and made this, you know, um, kind of like an underfunded effort at the Water Board's a formal program, um, this came through in um, late 2019. And um, we received uh, the funding. It was, it was quite a bit delayed because of the COVID actions, uh, you know, emergency actions, and um, we were able to start. Uh, uh, developing out the program uh, in the winter of 2020 and uh, start uh, hiring those dedicated permanent staff and establish uh, contracts to utilize the annual dedicated funding. And with the program and now being formal program, we are, um, our purpose and objectives are significantly expanded to also address the legislative mandates uh, in particular to conduct, uh, just, sorry, to establish a monitoring program comprehensive across the state um, to, at many different scales, water body scales, watershed to track the status and trends of harmful algal blooms, uh, particularly recurring ones in uh, priority waterways and watersheds, and um, also conduct applied research, tool development, outreach, education, and conduct studies also that can inform what, what are the driving particular blooms in certain areas and inform uh, management actions and uh, regulations. So the program, again, is, is definitely um, expanding quite a bit from where, you, where you've seen it, focusing on you know, recreational waters and incident response communication and so forth. And a little plug before we move on, uh, you know, Becky brought this up that there's some changes on the homepage of the California HABs portal. So um, recommend anyone new to kind of CC HAB to take a look at the primary um, website for all things um, HABs, at least inland HABs um, at, at the waterquality.gov. And um, in that um, HABs portal, uh, you can find, you know, where HABs occurring, both with like remote sleep sense data and with voluntary reports, um, outreach material on how to stay safe, um, you know, for um, also dogs, livestock, um, and so forth, and how advisories are issued and communicated, uh, particularly the CCHAB guidance on responding to blooms and the pre-made signage when it's appropriate, and kind of sampling protocols, who's monitoring, who's out there, and announcements. Um, so everything's housed in this, this portal, so I'm gonna put a little plug on that. All right, so folks have been asking who's new. Uh, I wanna get introduced to the new staff um, that have been hired for the, for the program. And um, normally my colleague, Keith Boma Gregson would be kind of co, um, co-speaking with you, but he's actually in the audience today. Um, he recently uh, changed positions and works with the USGS in Sacramento and continuing to work on, on HABs, but he's no longer with the water boards. Um, so the FHAB program leadership has changed. Um, I'm continuing to work on um, or to provide um, leadership and I've been working to develop the HAB programs for nearly six years. My education is in microbiology and a master's in focus of um, environmental toxicology. I've been a co-chair of CCHAB several years ago and uh, definitely looking forward to building this program, particularly the monitoring program and um, partnership components. Also the, um, the second co, like kind of co-leadership for the program includes Carly Nilsson. Um, she joined um, us in May and comes from the Lahontan Regional Water Board with almost 15 years of experience in several different water quality programs, including TMDL development. We talk about that quite a bit in this um, network. And she's also previously a swamp coordinator role and has um, education focused in environmental um, biology. And uh, I will go over the rest of the rest of the team because uh, you guys have been introduced to them uh, previously. 
And uh, there's three more uh, dedicated and again, permanent staff um, highlighted here in green. Uh, they are uh, located at um, three of the regional boards at our agency. Uh, first one I kind of go from like kind of north to south uh, versus Mike Thomas. He's at the North Coast Regional Board. He comes from the state of Wyoming, where he worked in the Department of Environmental Quality and developed their HABS program, which focused on reporting, monitoring, and analysis. He has a master's focused on aquatic ecology and freshwater symbioses. And I'm uh, just going to be introducing each of the folks. Some of them are on the line as well, but uh, it's a little difficult to coordinate um, everyone saying hello. So I'm just going to kind of do int introductions for everyone. And uh, you will be hearing from them over time, particularly providing updates on their monitoring and special studies that are happening in their in their kind of uh, backyard in their regions as well. So I'm going to provide that. Um, next up is the Central Valley Regional Board, um, Regional 5. It's, a, it's the largest region of the regional boards covering the North and Southern Central Valleys. Um, Karen Atkins, she joined us last month. Um, so all these, all these folks are just right now um, kind of joining us and getting onboarded. Karen Atkins comes from UC Davis and she recently finished her doctorate in, um, in uh, benthic, uh, sorry, periphyton and benthic algae um, monitoring in Tahoe and um, some water mon uh, modeling as well. And previously, she worked at the Sierra Fund, a nonprofit on water quality projects. And for Region 6, which is the Lahontan region, um, again, going from the Oregon border uh, down to like kind of like northern um, LA. To Are you doing it? <clears throat> Would you like to learn about blue algae in the state of California? Sure. Looks like we got someone who's unmuted. But enthusiastic. Yes, please, please, <laughs> yes, enthusiastic, but please mute if you're not speaking. Thanks. Okay. Um, the fifth uh, person, again, going north to south is Sabrina Rice. Uh, you've heard from her also in the past. Um, she comes to us from the Lahontan Regional Water Board as well. Um, she has uh, worked in the FAB program for the past approximately uh, two years and um, has education in environmental mm -hmm. management and protection. And that kind of sums up the, the new folks um, that are dedicated to work on the HABS program. And we continue to work um, again with all of the regional boards to implement the HAB program. And the other HAB coordinators are listed here. And um, just want to um, put out a plug with them. They, they, they do work on many different program areas and are borrowed, their time is borrowed to be able to work on the immediate priorities. Again, it's incident response and communication and you know, implementing the CCHAB guidance to get um, advisories posted when appropriate. And uh, also collaborate with the regional swamp coordinators as well to um, kind of like um, to leverage the ambient monitoring that's going on to also um, implement some harmful algal bloom monitoring as well in routine monitoring sites that are priority and priority watersheds. All right, and, and another addition um, due to the legislative bill, the Department of Fish and Wildlife um, also requested dedicated staff to implement the bill. Um, their agency was um, you know, one of the responsible entities highlighted as well. Uh, Jenna Rind um, has joined um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife and um, will be the statewide harmful algal bloom lead. She comes to us from the Department of Water Resources where she has been wor working on harmful algal bloom monitoring, particularly in the Delta waterways. And um, she's also um, joined the HAB related illness work group um, along with these other folks um, uh, in the state agency HAB leads that work on the illness work group that um, kind of like um, comes to action whenever there's a report from the public or from our partner entities um, about a potential illness, you know, wildlife, dog, livestock, um, and also human illnesses. Um, this team uh, provides that response, investigation, and support to, um, you know, physicians, veterinarians, and so forth. All right. Another event that happened um, regarding the um, the legislative bill, it requires annual reporting. So that has come in, come to pass uh, by July 1st, there was a requirement for the first year report, though, again, with funding delays, books were not in place at that time. So we I did a shorter report to address the requirements. 
um, particularly uh, kind of like a historical report. Um, that's what was asked for. Um, previous actions that have been taken um, over the past three years, recommendations to address HABs. And um, we will be doing a subsequent report that will be much more comprehensive with what recommendations we have to be able to implement all of those objectives in the ledge bill um, next year and um, definitely take advantage of you know full year with everyone on board. and. Um, implementing the program. And you can take a look at um, these reports that we're required to publish. It's on the Waterboard Swamp Hab page. Um, we've, we got them um, published there and we will be putting links on the Hab portal um, over time. Also, um, uh, we've heard from Jamie Smith over the past two years, updates on the monitoring strategy that was developed for, um, for the FHAB program in anticipation of getting dedicated funds to develop a comprehensive monitoring program around the state. Um, that report um, has been posted to the Water Board's webpage. Um, that took quite a while, particularly for the ADA um, requirements, but happy to say that it has been posted um, again on the Swamp Hab webpage and there's three components um, including the full report, the executive synthesis, and a fact sheet. And I just wanted to throw a snapshot of that uh, for folks that's uh, easily digestible, you know, um, brief uh, kind of document just to kind of go over the main points of uh, the strategy and how um, what its recommendations are to implement a comprehensive monitoring program. Uh, what kind of research will be needed as well to um, be able to meet those goals and how it'll be implemented across the state. Um, and it's kind of like something that will be implemented in about five to 10 years. It's like a long-term long -term plan as resources are available. And we're really looking forward to being able to start building that out, implement it uh, where the legislative objectives also overlap. All right, I'll take a brief pause. Um, go to the, if there's any comments or if, folks um, would like to unmute themselves and ask a few questions. Go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Axel Striegler here. Um, Minister, thank you so much for, for the information. That's very interesting. Um, I just wanted to take the opportunity quickly and, and just uh, mention that uh, Salofa Oil, our company, uh, is actually a um, developer uh, of a test called Blue Green Test, which uh, mm -hmm. is the first on-site rapid diagnostic tests for the detection of uh, various cyanotoxins. And we've done quite a bit of work over the last years and would like to create awareness about like how the test performs, what it does. It's not just uh, a highly sensitive, but also a quantitative measure that allows on-site rapid detection rather than sending samples, water samples off to labs across the country, waiting for results to come back and then really have some post uh, information later on about like what the uh, toxin level might have been at that particular state, let's say a week ago or so. Thanks for that information. Um, so you're, you're, you're speaking to a, a, a tool to use out in the field for like rapid kind of uh, semi-quantitative data while you're waiting for lab analysis, is that right? Um, not just, I mean, we're, okay. we also can do like full quantitative, uh, uh, we, can, we can detect uh, with um, closing greeting uh, greeting our app. app. Mm -hmm. With our app, we can also detect the quantitative measures, so down to, let's say, 0.1 microgram per liter right. um, detection, so it's very uh, high accuracy there. Mm -hmm. And um, we've, we've uh, been using this, um, this has been developed in Scandinavia and Finland uh, with uh, most of the well-known universities and research centers there, and then we've um, uh, expanded on that over the last few years. And um, we did find uh, some very interesting finds, uh, specifically with the uh, level of toxins typically being at the highest level once no uh, bloom is visible anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and uh, extremely high levels. So it can be very um, um, misleading uh, looking at the, at the blooms, at which site usually the, uh, the toxin levels are not as high. So, then, so this uh, is later this on. is Thanks sorry for... sorry this is Dave Karen um, I, I just I, I'm a little wary about us uh, taking too much of Marissa's time for uh, uh, I, this is a, sounds like a really interesting technique and there's a lot of questions I'm sure that will develop which toxins what are their limits of detection what are the methods of detection but I don't think we will be able to spend time right now going into great depth on this I'd, I'd rather 
um, have us focus on Marissa's talk if we could. Sorry, but we have Absolutely. to be a little bit Absolutely. careful about having this platform be used as a commercial venue. Thanks. And I, I totally understand. I just wanted to create awareness and um, please, we are happy to send out information. Yep, I'm sure there'll be questions in the chat. There are already a few and um, please feel free to respond to them. Thank you very much and sorry for the interruption. Yeah, thanks for your input and, and thanks, Dave. Yeah, we're all held to time. Um, we've got um, a full agenda today. Uh, but thanks for bringing up the information and folks, please ask your, your kind of questions in the chat um, on this, this new tool. Let me see if I can open up the chat. Are there any others regarding kind of like the material I went over? No, I think you're good. Okay, great. All right. So let's kind of get, keep continuing with the material. So updates on monitoring, in particular, some of the events that we've been co-hosting with the CC Ad Network uh, this, this summer. So um, for those of you um, who are longtime members of CC Have Network, you know, you're aware that um, I think it was 2018 in the summer, we launched the first pre-holiday assessment events. Um, so this is the fourth consecutive year. Uh, back then we focused primarily on Labor Day weekend. So this is an effort to um, collect um, to collect samples to assess priority recreational waterways uh, immediately before the the uh, holiday weekend and considering a time that <laughs> um, that's needed, particularly what the previous um, person just highlighted, there is some time that's needed to get your samples that you collect analyzed in laboratory so you can toxin concentrations and compare to the uh, CC Hab guidance um, and those trigger levels. So we do allow for a two week period prior to each um, holiday weekend to collect your samples, get them to the lab and get that data to us. Um, and uh, this is the first year um, that we are hosting three consecutive holiday events. This was recommended in the FHAB monitoring strategy effort, particularly from the TAC members, the Technical Advisory Committee, um, as a uh, way to um, get uh, some more monitoring um, uh, some more monitoring data um, collected across the state, particularly in priority waterways um, and multiple times per year so we can build that data set. Um, so we um, really um, look forward to these events in partnership across the state uh, with members to be able to collect samples. Um, and also this year we were able to dedicate additional funds to this effort. So we are, um, we've dedicated approximately $160,000, $170,000 um, this summer um, to support the lab analysis um, for those that do not have that ability themselves. Though we have some member, uh, some members also um, collecting samples and just providing the data um, as well. So um, if you're interested in the la Labor Day weekend um, upcoming uh, kind of assessment starting in middle of August, um, please let us know by completing the survey and I'll put the link in the chat window after I'm completed too, so you can have that handy. Um, it's a survey just to let, you know, let us know if you're interested in participating, either you know, you've got the sampling and lab analysis on your own handled or you'd like to participate with su support. Uh, we are providing sampling kits and um, shipping costs and to our um, uh, water boards contracted laboratory, Ben Genetics in Sacramento for the lab analysis. Um, so please express your interest in that survey. I would look forward to partnering with you. Um, the co-chairs asked for kind of like a snapshot of how the, the, the most recent holiday assessments went. Um, so I've just got um, a snapshot of our um, web map that's on the HAB portal that shows all reports um, that are being investigated as well as the holiday assessment data. So all that's combined to give a, a comprehensive snapshot of what advisories are in place, what kind of monitoring is happening across the state. Um, this is a quick look at uh, Memorial Day on the left and um, before 4th of July on the right. You'll see that there's a lot more monitoring happening um, in June, and particularly there's been a lot of reports and um, a lot of data being provided from um, like a regional specific or water body specific monitoring programs from many of the partners here in, in CC Hab. Um, so a lot of that data is also presented on this map as well. Um, for the holiday assessment for Memorial Day, uh, so again, it was the first time that we did one so early in the year, though we did notice that HABs were um, forming a little earlier due to the low water levels, the warmer temperatures, um, drought conditions. Um, 
just from looking at a quick cursory of review of our data set, um, about 24 different water bodies, including um, large river seg segments, were assessed, uh, particularly just for this holiday assessment. Again, not for a response to incidents or other um, folks uh, regional monitoring programs. So um, in some, we were able to assess approximately 110 sites, uh, recreation sites or sites of interest um, that provide access to waterways. Um, and that information is provided on the web map and heavily advertised with um, some press communication and through the CCHAB network as well. Um, we have several participating entities um, listed here. Can't um, name you all off. Um, there's a pretty long list, uh, but really appreciate everyone's um, participation. Um, I've listed out some of the organizations starting from like Northern California down to the South um, and quite a broad range from tribal governments to nonprofits um, to some other state agencies, volunteers, and also water districts and irrigation districts. Um, and again, thank you for all your guys' interest if you are on, um, on online today. The holiday assessment for the 4th of July, um, there were less water bodies sampled just for um, the holiday assessment. Um, some partners were unable to collect samples due to, you know, holiday events, uh, their own vacation, <laughs> that kind of thing. So that happens sometimes. Um, it's, again, this is our first year doing three consecutive holiday events. So we're gonna, we're gonna learn from this a little bit more. Um, we did have um, many more sites assessed um, that were updated onto the web map, web map. And this includes also the um, routine monitoring from uh, particular programs. So there's approximately 165 sites and um, uh, the, the same entities as well that were listed. Uh, this is a little bit different kind of snapshot from previous year. Um, some some other entities were not able to participate this summer, um, but we hope to be able to do outreach to them and um, um, encourage um, their involvement next year. Um, looking forward to expanding partnership for these holiday assessments. All right. And then also some other monitoring that the water boards um, is kind of like leading or funding, um, particularly in partnership with many other um, groups around the state. Um, going to go from um, kind of north to south again, um, providing uh, just kind of a snapshot of these different kind of monitoring efforts that are happening. Um, and again, we're, we, these were launched um, in early spring in anticipation of getting um, the dedicated funding for the program in place. Um, so we're happy to say that we were able to get um, the first round of annual contracting funds in a contract and primarily to fund laboratory analysis statewide. Um, and so with that, we, uh, we developed several um, special studies or monitoring efforts that are one or two years in length. Most of them run not just in the peak cab season from May to October, but also year round to get routine and frequent uh, data to inform um, management decisions and understand more about the dynamics, the bloom, bloom conditions and water quality um, to understand a little bit more about drivers as well. Um, many of these projects don't just look for HAB toxins, also taxonomy, um, nutrients, uh, chlorophyll, other water chemistry, and so forth, um, in partnership with also some uh, with the, the swamp monitoring program funds as well. In some, um, for the regional monitoring efforts, um, we have allocated $380,000 um, for the next two years for these studies, in addition to 80,000 for a statewide um, benthic algae stream assessment. Again, these are going through the next two years. Uh, due to COVID, some of the studies had a little slow start in spring, um, you know, for those mandatory precautions. Um, but we'll be planning again this winter for some additional special studies, particularly in the North Coast, to, um, in collaboration with uh, their partner entities, um, to uh, take a look at um, getting consistent, like, you know, routine monitoring data for some priority waterways and expansion of monitoring also in the Central Valley. So here's a just kind of brief snapshot. So um, going from the Central Coast, uh, they have a priority watershed and coastal confluence ambient monitoring program, and they've added HAB monitoring to that effort, and the sites are approximately monthly sampled. In the Central Valley, there's two efforts. Uh, one's focused on Hensley and HB Eastman Reservoirs, and this is a targeted primarily HAB monitoring study, including nutrients, um, 
to understand the hab occurrence magnitude um, across the whole year um, in open water and shoreline sites. There's also a project in the Delta Waterways looking at microcystis um, source tracking study. Um, and we're partially funding this in coordination with the Delta Regional Monitoring Program. In Lahontan Regional Board, um, again on the high Sierras, the eastern side of California, they have several um, really interesting monitoring projects as well going on. Um, some of them are continuing from the previous year, including um, a multi-year partnership with the Tahoe Keys POA, taking a look at the Tahoe Keys Lagoon um, mitigation project and um, collecting data on you know, before and after um, this management with this management tool. Another uh, study focused on Red Lake, which is um, a have impacted lake in high elevation in a relatively undisturbed watershed. And this is in partnership with Alpine Watershed Group. All right. Um, and some other uh, projects also in Lahontan, looking at high elevation lakes in coordination with UC Davis and um, kind of regional wide targeted monitoring effort to understand the HAB duration and magnitude in several of their priority lakes. In the Colorado River um, Regional Board, there's a study going on in the Salton Sea uh, to assess the benthic algal mat um, cyanobacterial biomass um, in this early unique lake. It's um, you know, hypersiline and eutrophic. Uh, this is a year round study as well. And um, in Santa Ana, there's a special study on Lake Elsinore in Riverside County and Big Bear Lake as well um, in Riverside. Um, and it's an ambient monitoring study year round um, to collect um, routine monitoring data to also inform uh, nutrient TMDLs that are coming up for renewal there. In San Diego, there's um, a monitoring effort to look at um, streams. Uh, in particular, um, previous work has been looking at lakes and wetlands, um, and this focuses on two other watersheds that are priority for that region as well. And um, for a statewide project um, impacting the whole state, uh, this is a partnership with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and uh, the Water Board's um, Reference Stream Monitoring Program, or RCMP um, uh, for short. And many folks have been asking us about this data, so just have a quick snapshot about that. Um, so this um, RCMP program, uh, again, with the Department of Fish and Wildlife and the Water Boards looks at weightable streams. This has been going on for 10, 15, maybe 20 years. Um, this program, I'm, I don't have their exact history memorized, uh, but long-term pro uh, program under the bioassessment effort. And uh, this summer, we are funding um, HAB talks analysis for the samples that they already collect uh, for the benthic algae assessments. Um, and uh, we're expecting sampling to occur from May to October. And uh, this summer is unique that they will be returning to these sites uh, twice per year and um, really be able to get an idea of um, what's going on in these reference sites for the program. And um, when there's toxin detections of significance. We are following the CCAB guidance for uh, public posting of toxic algal mats. Most of these sites are in very remote areas, but some of them are, you know, in particular areas um, where there's lower elevation are nearby some recreational sites. And we are posting this data onto the web map as well. So you can take a look there. Um, and uh, right now, the most recent data has come from the Lilhontan region and we're anticipating more data coming, um, going um, sorry, we're anticipating the field crews to keep on going south and collecting additional data. Um, one, uh, like, one of the spots did have significant um, toxin data, particularly for microcystins that exceeded the acute action level for dogs, and it was near a recreation site and um, popular trail. So we worked with um, the local national forest for getting that posted. Um, and that, that, was, that was a surprising result um, that many folks have been contacting us about. So thank you for your interest and we'll provide a summary of this, this study um, later on in the year. Can I take a pause there? Is, are there any comments, feedback um, on this material? If you'd like to learn more, um, I'm sure the um, Water Boards folks can provide uh, kind of summaries, findings, um, if um, that is available for the agenda and the co-chairs are interested. If anyone has any quick comments or questions, please unmute. 
I, I actually had one, uh, Marissa, to, to start off. Um, you mentioned the new coordinator for California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Right. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the nature um, or the extent of cooperation or interaction that there will be with the, um, with the FHABs program? Do you know what that's going to look like or is this just so new that you don't mm -hmm. know yet? Yeah, yeah, you're kind of answering there right at the end. Um, it is a very new, um, a new position, a new effort um, at the water management program of the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And um, we are working closely on developing out like what that partnership and that collaboration will be um, and where that will like, where, where the efforts will be focused, right, with the, such a big state. What area are you going to focus on first? Because you know, taking the whole statewide area as one big chunk is, is a you know heavy lift. So um, we, we can provide more information hopefully at the next meeting and update on how that's going to um, come together. Uh, but yeah, we we have been in talks with with uh, Jenna and her group, uh, Jenna Rind, on um, developing out that partnership and. Um, with the infrastructure of um, the program developing and implementing the program, we also um, are planning on um, shoring up uh, like um, existing relationships with other state agencies and expanding that those partnerships to others, particularly those that were listed um, as coordinating agencies in the legislative bill um, to get um, you know, a comprehensive statewide effort to um, monitoring, addressing harmful algal blooms because, um, you know, it is affecting many different agencies and their jurisdictions and their priorities um, just a little differently for each agency. Thanks. And the, the holiday assessment, um, just to be clear, because I'm not clear, um, I think you had 24 and 16 groups that were participating for, um, I think, 16 on the 4th and 24 for that. Right. Are you are you always looking for more water bodies to participate or are you maxed out or I mean, what are what are the considerations there would yeah, good question. So be better. Yeah, more would be better. So we're not maxed out in like um, the effort to have uh, more partners. Um, we, we can def we definitely have the capacity to bring more partners, particularly if um, they can provide their own laboratory analysis. Um, right now we um, with with who's who um, the entities that have signed up for the Labor Day assessment, we do have room for maybe two more um, water bodies to be added with the funds that we have dedicated to this this um, this event. Um, so we do welcome a couple more folks um, to come and ask um, for support. Again, that's for sampling um, sampling tools, um, shipping of your samples, and lab analysis at the state contracted laboratory. Um, but otherwise, we welcome anyone to participate and provide the data um, with, um, let me just go back to the timeframes. Um, the timeframe uh, for submitting your data that you do, do from your own monitoring effort. Um, I know there's lots of monitoring happening that we don't always necessarily know about. Um, so welcome you to, to express your interest in um, sharing this, particularly if you're monitoring recreational waterways and really showcase your efforts to protect um, protect folks, folks. Um, we can help you publish that information. The data is um, requested by um, September 1st. And you can, again, fill out the survey. I'll put a link in. Great. Chat. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, yeah, so this is Hal McLean, East Bay Parks. Um, is there going to be a, an email reminder with a link for that stuff? Um, because that's yes. that, that, I think we missed we missed the the Independence Day one because we didn't get a reminder. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, we normally do about four weeks beforehand um, a, a a reminder in the list serve um, for the CC Hab list serve. But I can understand that if that gets missed. Um, but your data was still um, included because um, you have a routine monitoring effort and share your data weekly with us. So. Um, your data did not get lost, but um, I do know you do do a special effort for each holiday assessment. So um, sorry to, to have missed your data set. All right, any other questions about the holiday assessment? All right. Sounds good. And um, 
let's go back to the last section, um, kind of like infrastructure um, for the program, um, you know, how we're expanding, how it'll impact CC HAB members, particularly with what resources will be available over time. Um, so with the program expanding, we're looking at a two-year plan. Um, and as you know, we've been, we're onboarding and training new staff. We've got our um, funds into contracts, which is no small feat at a state agency. It takes about a year and a half to get contracts in place. So it is difficult to get your funds allocated and encumbered. Um, and when we're doing a staged rollout of the recommendations of the FHAB's monitoring strategy. So this is that report um, that came out and the, the effort with several different technical advisors um, that Jamie Smith of um, Squirp has been speaking to CCHAB over the last couple of years. Um, and that report's been posted to the water boards. Granted, it's been posted online as well. Um, and it does complement the legislative mandates on many different areas, particularly monitoring, research, outreach, that kind of thing. So uh, we're looking forward to rolling that out. Um, a quick recap of the monitoring framework um, that was uh, that's being implemented over the next five and ten years. Um, we'll be developing a partner monitoring program, strengthening remote sensing, field surveys, looking at FHAB drivers, um, and also integrating HAB monitoring uh, across the water boards and with our partner entities. And um, it's kind of like um, uh, some other efforts that are happening already at the water boards to implement um, uh, HABs into different programs. There's the regional boards uh, recently did, um, uh, sorry, posted 303D listings for impaired waterways, uh, in particular to cyanotoxins. Um, a few regions have um, published those recommended listings for review and comment that's posted to the water boards listserv under integrated report. Um, if you'd like to um, have more information on that, I can put a, a comment and chat for a link to that so you can get updates. Um, the Division of Drinking Water recently re um, requested and received um, cyanotoxin-specific notification levels, um, again, for the drinking water program. These levels were developed by the OWIHA toxicologists. Um, um, that um, same agency that Becky Stanton represents, and those have been published on the WEHA website as well. Take a look at those if you're interested in drinking water um, treatment and um, those kind of standards. And also the Division of Water Quality at the Water Boards has committed to developing cyanotoxin trigger levels under the biostimulatory water quality objectives and that policy development that's underway for lakes and streams. So um, that is something that's coming along. Uh, we don't have a timeline for that. I ho hope that at a future update, we can actually give you a timeline. But uh, if you have questions, you can always contact myself um, and Carly and we'll have our email at the end of this presentation. And just some um, tools and efforts that are, um, will provide resources again to CCM members. Um, we are, um, developing um, a modernized data system in collaboration with some other entities across the country, the, the commons and internet of water um, to connect our HABs database system also to a um, user friendly um, data entry uh, system um, uh, with water data reporter and uh, also modernize our web mapping tool that's on the portal and this will be coming together by the winter of this year so we're looking forward to that to also support our, our future partner monitoring program as well um, you know we need, we need something that um, anyone um, can uh, provide their data and also understand what kind of data they have um, map it analyze it um, in a user-friendly kind of um, framework and we haven't had that kind of system in place and um, so we're looking forward to that. Also um, we um, are already implementing these holiday assessments and we're going to be developing a pilot of the partner monitoring program um, to kind of complement also some partner efforts that are already happening statewide at regions. And really large effort is on remote sensing program and expanding that and strengthening it, particularly um, expanding some functions of the existing web tool that's available again on the portal and um, obtain remotely sensed chlorophyll A measurements. Um, this is already provided by federal agencies and we are planning on uh, presenting that data on the portal and obtain higher resolution uh, products also for chlorophyll in smaller water, board, water bodies. Because again, our web tool is limited to the very largest um, lakes and kind of broad channels, approximately 250 waterways across the state. And we hope to get higher resolution so we can have more data to inform, um, inform what's going on with um, bloom development. 
And also we're going to be developing out <clears throat> analysis methods to take that large data set across the year for satellite imagery and the remotely sensed pigment data um, and um, understand also what data quality is so we can understand what how it can be used right now it's used for a screening tool and um, if the quality is adequate we can also use it for additional um, ma management actions monitoring programs and so forth so looking forward to building that out and uh, much of our efforts are going to be on that in the next two years and just a reminder for folks um, members uh, that we do have durable signs available. So these are hard plastic signs of the CCHAB uh, advisory signs. They're available. So contact us if you um, need additional signs in preparation for postings or um, if you have postings right now. We also have toxic algal mat signs available and the general awareness signs as well. Um, Marissa, this is Leslie Choate. How are you? Hi. Hi, um, Hi Leslie. Um, are you starting to make the hard plastic signs in the harmful algal bloom sign? Because you didn't have them before. Right, right. So um, let me go back one. We're planning um, in our next contract that will be in place in the next few months, um, we are planning on being able to print also these hard plastic signs and the toxic algal mat signs as well. Right now, these, um, these algal mat signs are only available as laminated, uh, 11 by 14. Um, uh, it's kind of sized, um, kind of like hard paper plastic kind of signs, but um, right, yeah. we have some of those, yeah, yeah. I know there's definitely interest in getting the larger ones and mm -hmm. more durable, yeah. We're working on okay, great. And the then the, the one on the right, the look out for har harmful algal blooms, right. are you making those as well? You're making them more in the harder, um, okay, so the more durable, yeah, right. okay, the more durable, they're not metal because of right issues with them being stolen uh, right. but yeah we're we're planning on develop um printing like a few thousand of those at our next contract effort um to get Perfect. more of those but we do have a few hundred of these ones on the right still available so if you are interested in just general awareness signs and these are the ones that were produced by the epa we do have them available just give me a little more of a heads up because i have to go to kind of like the warehouse and dig them out but well, yeah we have them available want some. <laughs> <laughs> okay send so us we'll, an email we'll, uh, we'll keep an eye out thank you yeah and um, to, to reach both of us, the uh, leadership of the HAB program, and even get like your, um, your information to the particular co-leads co and coordinators, you can send us an email at our shared inbox, sinohab.reports, or on the portal, there's um, a link on the homepage to state agency contacts, and you can reach out to the new folks. Um, really welcome your guys' um, outreach and questions. And that concludes this kind of information that we're providing. Okay, great. Um, we have five minutes still for questions. People have questions. Feel free to unmute. I have a bit of discussion going on in the chat, so that's great yeah, to see. It, it, it's, <laughs> If it's folks been... are more comfortable there, that's fine. Um, you can always reach out to us by email as well. And I'll, I'll go into the chat and answer any unresolved questions as well. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Becky. Thank you. Um, that was great information. And um, it, it's really nice to see things moving in the right direction in terms of developing monitoring plans and, and, and what that will bring, that awareness mm -hmm. will bring. Um, yeah, we're thank looking you. Thank you. forward to it. Good. It's great. And great to see new people coming on too. Yeah. Um, Spinning the team. One last chance for questions. Anyone have any? If not, then I think we have a few extra minutes. Uh, we have a break coming up, so we will probably go into that right now. And then we will be back at um, 1010, I believe it is. And we will start with the presentation that will come up next with Ellen Priest. So thank you all. We'll see you in at that time. Great. Thank you, Dave.
Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Hopefully you had a good break. Had a couple extra minutes. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, going to be Ellen Priest, uh, who is going to talk about her microcystis uh, source tracking uh, work in Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta. Um, are there any comments or announcements, questions before we hand it over to Ellen? Then Ellen, I think you're good to go. Great. Well, thanks for having me. This is a project that I'm working on with the Central Valley Water Board and specifically Janice Cook and Matt Kraus are the people that are out on the boat most days collecting the samples for this project. And then I'm also working with Tim Otten and he is leading the laboratory analysis side of this project. So this is Although my name is on the front of this, this is actually um, a presentation that can be put together because of all of these people's efforts. So I'm just gonna give a quick overview of uh, the Delta for those people that are maybe less familiar with this area of the state. Microcystis was first detected in the Delta in 1999. And the delta um, is this picture here on the right, this map on the right. You can see the legal boundary of it and that brown outline where the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers converge and then flow into San Francisco Bay eventually. The cyanobacteria community in the delta is generally dominated by microcystis. However, we see a phantosonum and endolicospermum and a number of other cyanobacteria species out there as well. Uh, but when we see blooms out there, it's typically microcystis. There has been an exception to this uh, in wet and cool years where a phanazonamin and dolichospermum have also been shown to form blooms. To date, most of the toxicity in the delta is linked to microcystis. So there have been a lot of studies um, on the environmental drivers and other factors um, that are causing these blooms in the Delta, but it's not clear where the blooms are originating. And so our research team had some questions. We wanted to know, do microcystis develop and grow through multiple areas within the Delta? Because if you look down uh, a lot of channels in the Delta in the summer, you can see green bloom material as far as the eye can see. So is that bloom all originating in the locations that you actually see the scum? Or is it originating in locations that have longer residence time and then through tidal action and other wind dispersal spreading passively throughout the Delta? Here are some things that we know about sea habs in the Delta that we considered while we were putting together our project. We know that some locations are more prone to sea habs. We know that the Stockton waterfront and Discovery Bay almost every year are gonna have a nasty bloom. We also know that sites in and around the central and southern delta have been reported to have a lot of blooms. A lot of the sampling to date though has occurred at routine monitoring sites or um, if people wanna call in opportunistically and report a bloom to the water board, then we have information from that. But we don't necessarily have a wealth of information from some of the locations that have some of the worst blooms in the Delta. Another thing that we know is that the microcystis cells, like all cyanobacteria and other algae, deposit into the sediments in, in the late fall. And so those resting cells uh, then stay on the bottom of the sediment until they're washed away or until they can bloom the following season when environmental conditions are right. Something else that we know about microcystis in the Delta that we're using in our study is there's at least 10 microcystis strains within the Delta. And that's important when we're trying to source track where blooms are originating from. We know six of the 10 of these strains are toxin producing. So based on the knowledge gaps and the information that we do know, we came up with a few hypotheses. The first is that the microcystis that are overwintering in the sediments 
from a few specific locations are the source of CHABs in distant but hydrologically connected locations. We hypothesize that by spring, there's little microcystis biomass will remain in sediments of flooded island sites, and we're defining those as Mildred Island and Frank's Tract for this project, and channels, like the main uh, channels where water is flowing through as opposed to the dead end flues to serve as bloom inoculum. And then we are hypothesizing that the peripheral sites so the Discovery Bay and Stockton waterfront where we know we have high microcystis concentrations each year will also carry the highest seed stocks into the spring. And we think that they are the primary sources of microcystis in multiple locations throughout the Delta. So this is a project overview of how we're gonna or how we're working to look at those hypotheses. First, we wanna look at the abundance of microcystis cells in the sediment. And we have eight different locations that we'll be using. I'll show you a map on the next slide so you can see where all our study sites are. And we're looking at total microcystis in the sediment and then also the toxic, the microcystin producing microcystis in the sediment. The next thing is, where and when are microcystis entering the water columns? Are there certain locations, Discovery Bay and Stockton Waterfront, that microcystis is entering the water column first? Because um, that would support the hypothesis that they're moving downstream or away from those incubation sites, potentially. And then the final piece is uh, molecular fingerprinting. And so the molecular fingerprinting, I don't have results for that that I'm gonna be able to report today, but it will be an important part of this study. And basically it will indicate the proportion of different strains of microcystis. So those 10 different strains can be used as a fingerprinting um, in the sediment and water, and then changes in the proportion of microcystis in time and space throughout the Delta. So these are the study sites. Oops. Um, so the blue study sites are the eight study sites that we have uh, chosen for our, our study here. We also had the San Joaquin River down at Vernalis. That was originally supposed to be one of our sites, but we went out there and we could not collect sediment samples. We tried kind of multiple different locations and every time we send the sediment core down, we were not able to capture sediment. And so we actually decided to remove that site from the study. And instead um, we added a second old river site um, into the study instead down here. So for our field methods, uh, we collect five sediment samples along a transect to determine the heterogeneity. So how are those um, resting cells settling out from the water column into the sediment. Are they evenly distributed or is there a lot of um, heterogeneity depending on where you collect the sample? Now this picture on the right shows what the ideal transect would have looked like. There's set, we we're originally gonna do seven um, sediment cores, but due to funding, we reduced that to five sediment cores. In reality, this was basically impossible to evenly space when you're out on the boat. Um, you know, for example, I went out with the water board crew to the Stockton waterfront and we sent the core over the boat, I, I don't even know how many times, at least 25 or 30 times just to get five samples. And so um, we just tried our best to space them as, as best as possible to get as good of a representation of each site. We did these five sediment sample collection events in November, 2020 and April, early May of 2021. The goal was to aim for 10 to 15 foot depth of water depth, um, but it ended up, depending on the sites, it ranged from about 10 to 40 uh, feet depth. Then we're gonna collect or in the process of collecting duplicate sediment samples and water samples in June and July, so twice a month in June and July. And that's really to capture, we're trying to capture the beginning of the blooms. When are those cyanobacteria cells moving out of the sediment into the water column? 
Um, and then one time a month in August and September, we'll collect those sediment and water samples. So this is Janice uh, out on the boat where we're collecting samples. And I just thought this would be a good way to show you the process of how we're collecting the core. So we send the tube over the side of the boat and hopefully get sediment. And then so on this picture on the left, you can see the sediment um, at the bottom of the core and we put it on the stand and push the water up through the top. In the second picture, you can see that we've pushed the water up and the sediment is getting pushed up into the tray. And then this final picture on the far right is where we now have the sediment. And so we take kind of like a butter knife and scrape uh, the top part of this off and put it into a tube, which is then delivered to Tim Alton's lab for genetic analysis. So we set it, we are lyophilizing all the sediment samples. We had thought about doing them wet, but the, the amount of water content in each of the samples varied greatly. And so to just try and make everything equal across sites, decided to lyophilize the samples. qPCR is being used to quantify microcystis. We're looking at, like I said at the beginning, at both total microcystis in the sediments and then, and in the water column, and then the toxigenic microcystis. And then we are um, starting to archive samples for the DNA fingerprinting. So once we have all of the samples collected from this whole study period, uh, Tim will do that molecular fingerprinting sometime later this fall. So we're also working on this second project that I presented on this project in more detail at the last CC Hub meeting. In this particular project, we're looking at microcystin accumulation at 10 sites in uh, crayfish and clam. And the reason I'm putting this map up here is because we're also archiving water samples from this project to, to use for the project I'm talking about today. Uh, just to provide some additional fingerprinting. So we're gonna have at least, um, throughout the summer, we'll have at least 18, a minimum of 18 sites where we are gonna be able to do this fingerprinting and see the different proportions of strains that are occurring at each site with the end goal of hopefully identifying where the origin of the blooms are. We're also opportunistically collecting other samples when the water board staff is out on the water and we'll be archiving those. So that's why I'm saying 18 plus, it will vary depending on where people get out on the boat. So now I'm gonna go through some of our preliminary results. And I should have probably said this at the beginning of the presentation, but it's probably become clear as I've been speaking that we're right in the middle of this study. And so I am presenting our initial results, but we don't, Project's not complete. We're not gonna have it complete until next year. And so um, maybe next year I can report back with our complete findings. But for now, the point of these slides is I broke it up so that there's two of these figures per slide and I tried to group them. So these are the flooded, what we're calling the flooded island sites. And the Y axis is very different on all of these figures. But the point of these, me showing you these figures is that you can see, so on the left is the November sampling and then on the right is the April or May sampling. The gray bars are the total microcystis and the red bars are the toxigenic microcystis. I was not able to add the toxigenic microcystis to the April slide, but because of the scale, we just got the results in yesterday. So I didn't have a chance to do, to do that, but because of the scale, I don't know that you would have seen much anyway. But the point of this slide is at Mildred Islands, we have five samples and you can just see that there's a lot of heterogeneity in our sample collection, um, which shouldn't be much of a surprise just considering that things are not gonna settle evenly out of the water column. Um, and then what's interesting is in April, and this, you'll see this at all the sites is that a lot of the microcystis cells, the, the microcystis cells are quite depleted compared to the fall right after the bloom has settled out of the water. And in Frank's tract, in fact, they're non-detect. So 
when we were out there in the spring, we didn't find any of the benthic resting cells, suggesting that they had been washed out during the winter. So we're going to see that it's a very similar story across sites. Um, let me just point out the y-axis here is 500 million um, is the max on the y-axis for Discovery Bay, and we're over at 160 million for Stockton waterfront. And I'm going to bring this up a couple of more times, but um, we believe that the Stockton waterfront numbers are lower than Discovery Bay, quite a bit lower than Discovery Bay based on where we sampled in the Stockton waterfront. We think if we had gone in further away from the highway there that we would have seen a higher seed stock. Um, and then Windmill Cove, this is another one of our sites that uh, is more protected. And so it's not surprising that we're seeing higher concentrations of the resting cells here. Buckley Cove, and then this is, oh, the label fell off this. This is Old River at Rancho Del Rio and Old River at West Canal. But to me, the most interesting finding from the Old River at Rancho Del Rio is even though the concentrations of cells are low compared to other sites is that the toxic proportion makes up um, a greater amount of the total number of cells at this location. So now I'm gonna summarize those figures that you just saw. This this summarizes all of that data so that you can see, use the same scale. So on the y-axis here, this is the total microcystis um, that we measured. And then we summarize those five samples that I just showed you into box plots to show the statistics. These red dots are the mean, um, and then the black bars are the median. And so what you can see in November is that we have the highest concentrations of resting cells at Discovery Bay, Mildred Island, Stockton Waterfront, which is a little lower for the reason I just mentioned, and Windmill Cove. So just pointing out the scale again, this is 500 million. And then in the spring, the top of the y-axis is 15 million. So really depleted. Um, we saw the cells really get washed out, but, and we're seeing the same, so Discovery Bay, Mildred Island continued to have a, high, a relatively high cell abundance and Windmill Cove and then the Stockton waterfront, um, not quite as high as we expected, but Frank's Track and Rancho Del Rio were completely scoured out from the winter. Now, as we all know, we're in a drought year. Um, and so we didn't have as much water moving through the delta that as we have in the past. And so perhaps um, if you're in a wet year, you're going to see more scouring and you would see a lot more of these cells washed out. That remains unknown. Okay, so these figures are summarizing the toxic uh, cells that we saw in the sediment. And so a much smaller y-axis than the total microcystis uh, that we saw. But what we're seeing is that where we have the highest cell count is also where we're seeing the highest number of toxic cells in general. So uh, the exception to that is Windmill Cove is a little bit lower, but it's still higher than like Buckley Cove or, or Rancho Del Rio. But Discovery Bay is a uh, clearly had the highest number of toxic microcystis cells in November. So once again, this is the same thing in April. And you can see, this is interesting that we really, at most of the locations, uh, there's not much toxic cells left over. Mildred Island is particularly interesting, even though we saw a high cell count at that location, the toxic cells have are quite a bit lower or non-existent essentially. Okay, moving into the water samples and I, I only have a handful of the water samples to present here today. So this is not a full analysis of all the water samples. But we're looking at total microcystis in the water column and Discovery Bay is these yellow triangles, these blue X boxes are the Stockton waterfront. And so 
based on what we've analyzed so far, it looks like microcystis is, is entering the water column first at Discovery Bay and Stockton Waterfront. When you move into the second sampling date, you're seeing it start to enter into Windmill Cove, which is this pink star figure. Um, but even though you had the high concentrations of microcystis resting cells at Mildred Island, you're not seeing it enter the water column as early at that location um, compared to these more what we're calling the dead end slough type areas. So what's the summary of our findings so far? Well, we have a lot of heterogeneity across sites. In both fall and spring, we're seeing those high concentration, highest concentrations of microcystis, Discovery Bay, Windmill Cove, Mildred Island, and Stockton. And then um, the toxigenic microcystis also matched up with these same locations. So um, just trying to think through like why are we not, even though there's these high concentrations of microcystis in the sediment at Mildred Island, it, it wasn't in the water column in those early months. Uh, it was by July. This is a picture we took when we were out there on July 3rd, and it's clearly in the water column along with some of Um, uh, But there were some pretty big clumps of microcystis. So it has entered the water column now, but we just haven't analyzed those samples. But I was thinking about temperature and the temperatures were pretty similar across the sites in early June. So close to 23 to 25 degrees Celsius. The highest spring water column concentrations were definitely at Discovery Bay and Stockton. So uh, we can rule out temperature doesn't seem to be a reason for why the blooms aren't occurring at Mildred even though there's that high seed stock earlier in the season. But there's definitely more water column turbulence there. Uh, just it's a windier site. There's a lot, there's more just velocity of the water column. And then we're not measuring, or, or we haven't summarized at least some of these things, although we're not measuring any of them at the sediment water interface. Um, just pH and light penetration into the water column down at the sediment water interface, redox conditions. And so maybe those factors are delaying the entry of the cells into the water column. So what do we have um, for the future of this project? Well, we need to analyze the June and October sediment and water quality samples. We also are gonna do a second round of that more intensive sediment surveys where we collected the five sediments from each location at the end of the bloom season in November and then at the beginning of April 2022. Um, I think that will, depending on the water year type, you know, maybe that will influence our results. And then we'll have the fingerprinting of all the water column and sediment samples, which will be an interesting part of this story. So this work kind of have been done with you know, Matt and Janice and Tim, and then all of these other peoples, including the funding for this project. And with that, I will take questions and Tim is on if anyone has any specific lab questions. And if I can't answer a sampling question, I saw Matt was on and so maybe he can help answer some of those questions as well. Great, thank you, Ellen. That was great. Uh, really interesting stuff. Really nice to hear the um, the, the seed bank idea um, looked at in a in a you know more concrete way. I mean, that, that's something for people who don't know in marine systems with things like alexandrium, which you know can result in paralytic shellfish poisoning. That's a big deal. Uh, the presence of those seed banks indicates uh, potential for bloom activity in, in that region. So um, it's really nice to see that carried over into fresh water. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, so if people have questions, please unmute, identify yourself and ask a question. Don't be shy. Hey, Ellen, this is Hal McLean. Hi, Hal. I, I 
sorry to get that email that you sent about uh, that you aren't going to be able to do the uh, aerosolized uh, toxin testing. Is that still is that still happening? Uh, there, there's another group that's going to be looking at it, uh, a little bit different approach than what I had spoken to you about, which was more of the health, human health based side of things. And what that was, was that was uh, looking at aerosolized uh, toxins um, actually on, on land, right? Or adjacent to the Delta. Uh, adjacent and, and for people that were working in the Delta. So people that are on boats working um, right. and exposed to spray potentially. Other questions? Hi, um, hey, Ellen. And, oh, go for it. Oh, sorry, Keith. <laughs> Hi, Ellen. This is Christine. Um, I was curious for your downtown Stockton sampling. You mentioned that um, you might consider changing the location uh, rather than being near the highway, the marina that's right there. Uh, have you considered maybe going down to Lake McLeod, which is the dead end portion um, in downtown Stockton? It seems like there's high residence time, very little mixing. Um, I would imagine you might get a better some better samples there. Yeah, I think you're right. So um, I, I thought I would add this to the end of my slide presentation so people could see where we sampled. And so we sampled, you can see here, and I, yes, if we went down, I think we would see what we were hypothesizing a little bit more. We were gonna see a higher seed stock that matched I mean, what I would guess more like the Discovery Bay seed stocks. Yeah, there's also that small slough just uh, a little further upstream of your Morelli boat ramp. Um, I think it's, I'm not sure if it's Mormon slough or anyway, it's kind of running parallel to the highway there in your slide. Oh yeah, Mormon slough. Um, that might be another good location as well for sampling since it seems to be high residence, low flow. Um, location that would feed right into your um, San, Joaquin, San Joaquin River sites. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. I believe we have some water samples um, collected from that location. But yeah, um, and you know what? It, we also found it's hard. The site that was chosen is where we're just we're struggling to pick up organic material from the bottom at that particular site. So. Maybe if we moved in or up here, or both, uh, it would be a little more easy to get those samples. Yeah, because that is a boat ramp barrier, so there's a lot of um, traffic, right. so to speak, with uh, boats revving engines, you know, <laughs> that sort of stuff, uh, trailers pulling in and out, um, price scouring. So yeah, I agree with your assessment that you know, try, trying to find some better, better sites. Go ahead, Keith. Thanks, thanks, Christine, and um, thanks, Ellen. Great project and great research. Um, I was just just curious where you guys think the cells are going um, in April. Like, is, if other folks who have done similar work in other systems had a hard time um, finding cells in the sediment, um, or um, or has there been pretty few um, other studies that have kind of worked in a more like tidal and dynamic system, like in like an estuary? Yeah, um, I don't know where, I'm sure, I don't know where the cells are going. So probably some are maybe being buried. Some are being, definitely being flushed out. Um, it's a good question. I don't know, other than being like Discovery Bay, right? There's not a lot of flushing of that particular site. So that, that hypothesis doesn't work there. So I don't exactly know. Tim, do you have anything to add? Do you know where you think the cells might be going? It's not, like yeah, it's not super well understood, the uh, overwintering of cyanobacteria and like what causes them to recruit. And, you know, the studies that have, there's some ways that you can look at it where you can take a trap and put it so that it's upside down. So it's facing towards the sediment and try to capture cells that are actually coming out of the sediment. And those estimates are usually kind of coarse, but it's usually a low percent. You know, it only takes like a couple percent of the benthic to like recruit and then, you know, have the growth to form the bloom. But it's not really well understood. I thought we would see more 
honestly, like there'd be more sticking around, but some of them are dying. I mean, there's just cells are lysing down there. I'm sure some are being exported. Um, I don't know when the clams start, start up again. I guess that's a question that, you know, if they're clam activity in the area, if they could be filtering some of the cells out that we're missing. Um, but the other thing is, you know, there's still like in some of these sites, millions of microcystis cells per gram. Like, I mean, that's like a lot of, of stock. I just, in the fall, there's just a tremendous amount that like a blanket just drops out. You have those scums on the surface that just sinks to the bottom. Um, and so there's still a lot persisting, but it's just, you know, 90 plus percent reduction. So that's kind of interesting. I thought Mildred, like I said, I really thought Mildred Island would be more scoured out than it was. I was surprised that so many were left in the spring. And that's why I was wondering if it was just like less water moving through there or what, what why is there so many more left there? It could be some that are getting pushed out, you know, like if the, what's being pushed into Old River, I don't know. Does that connect into Mildred Island? Could you have some fresh deposit throughout the winter? So that's where the, the fingerprinting will come in too. Like if the fall uh, Mildred Island population is different than like the spring population, then that would be evidence that like, well, what was there is gone. And, you know, something new has been put in there over the winter. I'm not sure. So I had a question um, uh, as to how you try and quantify uh, factors that might be ex uh, affecting recruit recruitment. I mean, when I think about it logically, um, those things that might affect the, the cells that are on the bottom coming back up and doing their thing, um, obviously temperature is one of them. And Ellen, you seem to, to kind of discount that. Temperature seems to be about the same. Obviously light, uh, maybe photo period, maybe you know the, the depth of the water is a big deal. Uh, Oxygen, uh, whether it is aerobic, anaerobic, somewhere in between in the hypoxic region. And then a disturbance, uh, water disturbance, to me seems to be a plus minus. At some point, uh, it's too much disturbance must be bad because it just whisks them away. And too little perhaps is not so good because maybe that allows for oxygen depletion or whatever. How do you go about quantifying those complex and interacting factors to try and get a handle on what your benthic seed bank is doing with respect to recruitment into the water column and bloom formation? Sorry, long question. Well, and I don't have a great answer for it at this point. I mean, I think like the purpose of this study, this was kind of like a, a first go at it, right? Like, let's see if these hypotheses are holding true. Let's really try to intensively study the, the benthic sediments and figure out where they're coming from. I think in Originally, this was part of a much larger uh, proposal where we were also going to work with um, some modeling to look at like different flows throughout the delta, and we were going to collect a, a number of other environmental parameters to help tease out some of those questions. And so, I this is almost like a pilot study, I guess, in a way. And I think um, the questions that you ask are really important. And so we could feed this into information to a larger story to or, um, a larger study to get a better handle on what's driving these once we understand where they really all are coming from right then we could pick then we could pick the locations where we're seeing the highest seed stocks and do a more intensive study at those to figure out what drives them coming out of the sediment and into the water column Other questions? Um, Ellen, this is Christine again. So I'm, I am kind of a little confused too. Like how do you rule out um, recruitment coming from upstream uh, watershed, like the upstream uh, rivers that feed into the San Joaquin, which then feed down into the uh, South Delta and the Central Delta, and you know, possibly even, of course, coming from Sacramento, being forced into the San Joaquin from the whole uh, pumping operations. So how do you, re how do you um, separate out recruitment from incoming uh, systems versus um, seed stock coming from benthic sediments? That's where the fingerprinting will come in. You know, if we can, link that genetically to 
like say Discovery Bay, then we could answer that question. But it's possible that we may, we might not be able to answer. If we're seeing strains that are coming from a site that we haven't studied, it won't be possible to say where, where the source of those is from. Is it from some other location in the Delta or is it from a tributary like you're saying or some other outside influence? Thank you. Is, is the fingerprinting, is that, are you using ITS? What are you going for, for doing the fingerprinting? I'm gonna let Tim answer that. Yeah, I think we'll use the ITS, maybe even two um, loci, so like uh, phycocyanin and ITS. We haven't actually finalized what, so for the study that I saw, this is from 2011 and 12, that was 16 to 23 as ITS. And that was just general like bacterial primers. And so the issue with that is so much of your sequencing is going to everything else. And then there are cyanospecific primers that would pick up other cyanos. So on the one hand, it's like we've focused on microcystis, but there is the opportunity to get, there's other cyanos out there and their distribution patterns could still be used to look at the connectivity. So if you see two strains of phantasomenon in one spot and only one elsewhere, you know, there's, you could use that as evidence that it's not heading, you know, to the other location where there's just the one strain. Um, but yeah, so some combination of that, looking at the SNPs within using, you know, Amplicon metagenomic approach. Yeah, I think that piece, that will be a really interesting part of this. That's why I said maybe next year at this time, we can present this again with all of that information because I think it will tell a better story. And your, your, your distributions of total versus um, toxigenic uh, strains or, or um, population abundances are, are interesting because sometimes they seem to be coordinated, sometimes not. Are you hypothesizing that toxin production has some sort of special selective advantage for strains of microcystis or um, are you just kind of looking for patterns at this point? At this point, we're just looking for patterns. That's all. Um, it's another great question, though. Yeah, I'd like to look into more of the mechanisms of recruitment and the, you know, the benefits of toxicity. But we were just kind of wanting to know, you know, if there's, on the one hand, you could, it could be that we go out and in the spring, we wouldn't have seen any seed stocks except for like one or two spots. And the, the scouring hypothesis would say, you know, we can really target for mitigation a few of these dead ends, but you know, when we originally were thinking this up, the windmill cove spot, you know, if you can see that, I think on this map, right? Yeah, up there, it's just that little slough. There's probably quite a few other spots that are gonna be incubating microcystis that we haven't really selected here, but it shows that like the bigger rivers, like San Joaquin, Old River, some of these things probably are not really like sources in the spring. They have been scoured out, um, but yeah, all the other, mechanistic questions that's kind of outside the scope of our this current effort i mean that when we were first like putting thinking about this and writing it if in fact it was just these like couple locations right that were the prime then source of the toxic toxins or the bloom material in general then you like tim was saying you could really focus where mitigations should occur and maybe that will still happen maybe we can pinpoint out like okay, you don't need to focus on these giant areas. If you just focus on these few isolated areas that can make a big difference throughout the Delta. Other questions or comments? We have a few more minutes if people have something. Uh, this is Becky. I guess that, that raised the issue for me. I think Tim was saying, you know, it might be 90% gone, but you still might have 10% left and do you, is there a sense there's a threshold that might be coming out of the sediment and recruiting, even if you didn't have this, you know, huge volume, might you still have enough there, even if it's not a major source that you just need a certain threshold of cells coming off to create, you know, that subsequent um, uh, recruitment and um, uh, growth within the water column. That's possible. Um, I think I'll just go back up real quickly. Yeah, 
you know, here, like at Frank's track, and we're, we're down to nothing, basically. So the study, you know, what we've shown so far is that it's suggesting that there, there's nothing to recruit from at these specific locations, even though in the fall, there were some, not a lot necessarily, well, not at Rancho del Rio, but at Frank's track, there were still some cells. And we're in fact, we're seeing like high toxin concentrations at Frank's tract in our benthic invertebrates. Granted, we don't know if that's from toxins being produced in Frank's tract or potentially being washed from other, you know, not the cells, but the toxins. Um, so I, yeah, I don't know what percent are being recruited or, you know, I think further studying those environmental conditions that are causing recruitment could also help answer that question. But it seems to be that at least in a couple of locations, there's not really cells to recruit in April. Great, thanks. We have a few more questions. Keith, do you want to jump on? Sorry, that was my earlier question. I just Oop, sorry. my hand. Then I think Jenna had a question. Hi, yes, sorry, I had to figure out the unmute button. This is a, a great, great study and I'm really glad you're looking into this. Um, I know this is outside your scope for this specific study, but I'm wondering, for me, this is surprising, like how much is getting scoured out in the Delta. I thought there might be more overwintering um, in like the deeper parts of the Delta. Um, I guess I'm, I'm curious, where is it going? Because obviously it's going downstream, but I'm wondering about the more brackish water marine impacts of what's being sent down there. Do you know if anyone is looking into that or? Um, you mean from like a benthic, like is anyone doing sediment coring further downstream? Yeah, or I'm just curious if there's any Anyone like, yeah, looking into that, because um, I think that's another big knowledge gap that I'm glad someone's looking at this in the, in the Delta, but um, further down, like, you know, estuaries are connected. And so, right. um, I know it's outside your scope. Sorry, this just got my wheel spinning. <laughs> well, maybe there's someone on here that can, that is aware of looking, well, uh, looking at the transition zone more. So um, we've been doing work with Dave Sen at SFEI and the USGS stations that span from the lower South Bay up into the Delta and the Sacramento River and uh, using metagenomics to look at the community. We don't really see that much microcystis beyond like the confluence. It just doesn't show up. And I mean, and these are grab samples, but we're, we tend to miss it. But we know those cells are going somewhere. Some of them are probably exported through the aqueduct pulled south, but then a lot of it still has to be going towards the bay. And the question is, are the cells intact? They could be lysed. They, there's a, a sentinel muscle monitoring program in the bay um, and that picks up microcystins year round, but we're not seeing any microcystin producing cyanobacteria in the cell counts. And so I think either they're just lysing for various reasons. There's viruses that kill these things as well. There's the salinity gradient that they hit at some point. And so that is, I think, an active question of like that mid between the bay and like the delta, the upper delta or whatever, what's what's going on in between that space. And like that'd be a good place to deploy spat bags versus like measuring particulate microcystin to see like how much of it is dissolved versus, you know, in uh, inside of cells. But yeah, that's an unknown right now. I, I had a question. I don't think I've got my, I don't know where my hand is here. I can't find it. Um, in, in terms of this, you're looking at uh, total microcystis. And we know that microcystins are produced by other species, for instance, anabena. And we have a lot of anabena out there now that we did not have before. Have you factored that into your evaluation? We, because we're basing this on the historical, you know, what we know so far is that microcystis is responsible for most of the microcystin. And I know the community is changing within the Delta. So at this point, no, we're not, 
we're focusing on microcystis specifically, but um, you know, certainly in the future, that I would think, be interesting to see. Or maybe Tim, you have more. Well, if we have yeah reason to believe that there's a lot of other, like if there, there's anabina blooms going on, we could, you know, sequence those microcystin genes and see if there's any toxic anabina or not. I have, haven't seen personally any other evidence of toxin producers besides the microcystis. So I don't, maybe you're aware of Peggy, if, if it's been def definitely shown that like the anabina or oscillatory or other things out there are at times producing toxin. Um, well, we, we have measured um, over the uh, a five year period, we have, we have measured uh, anabina uh, and a toxin A. So uh, we know that it's there. Uh, we're also we're picking up these days saxitoxin. So there are more toxins being produced, and I, I can't tell you, you know, how many of the anabena are producing microcystins. I don't know that. Maybe you can figure that out. <laughs> yeah. Well, we might we might look into it and see um, if we can get some of that information on some of these samples. Um, I don't think or, it would hurt. Or next project. Or, yeah, or, or the next right. phase, right? Yeah, I mean, we're trying to kind of combine our two, pro you know, like I was saying, we're, we're archiving all those samples from our benthic invertebrate, all the water samples from that project. So we're trying to kind of <laughs> utilize uh, as much on, on the water um, time that we have to try to tell as complete of a story we can with the funding that's available. Okay, um, that was a great talk, Alan and Tim. Thank you so much. Uh, I think we should probably move on. Um, we, um, I'm gonna see if I can switch this over now. We are at the point now where you should be seeing my screen. We're, we're uh, here for the regional coordinators reports. Uh, what I've done is um, I, I often have a little bit of difficulty sometimes knowing exactly where things are. What I've got are a few views up here on the, on the right. I have the, the regions, uh, the locations, um, territory-wise. And then uh, on the left, I've got the, the FHABs uh, event report up here. And so as we go through the regions, if you, like I sometimes do, have a difficult time knowing exactly where those boundaries are, uh, you can refer to those. Um, but I guess we will start with uh, region one, uh, find out what's going on. Do we have somebody from region one, please unmute yourself, announce yourself, and then give us the report. Hey there, David, this is Mike Thomas uh, from Region one, uh, just a heads up, uh, I just, there's a rat in my apartment. So maintenance is in here trying to capture that rat, but I'll be uh, <laughs> trying to go very quickly here. I'm glad we captured that on the recording. <laughs> yeah. That's gotta be a unique uh, excuse for, for anything. Go ahead. Yeah. All righty. Um, so for region one, the majority of our reports and investigations are involving benthic cyanobacteria, as you may be aware. Um, and we are working with our partners in the Eel, Russian, and Klamath uh, Basin, as well as um, the Trinity, Navarro, and Guala River. Um, we do have some cautions issued uh, throughout those water bodies. Um, but for the most part, um, it's not looking too grave uh, this time of year. Um, we are also sampling for planktonic blooms uh, and recreational lakes and reservoirs as part of the pre-holiday assessments. Um, and that would include like Lake Pillsbury, Ruth Lake, Lewiston Lake. And I, I believe we have a couple of cautions issued there. Um, where you just hovered over just a second ago on the Klamath, um, we are doing routine monitoring with the tribes in Pacificor up there. Um, there is a current caution for Copco and Iron Gate. Um, and that's gonna be, at least for Copco, elevated to a danger um, as of this evening. So, um, and then the Thule Lake National Wildlife Refuge, um, 
we, we do have cautions issued there uh, due to <clears throat> uh, visual indicators of bloom as well as um, uh, toxin hits, anatoxins. Um, we have received reports this year of a, a bloom potentially causing a fish kill on the Navarro. Um, we uh, decided that was likely due to abundant green algae and a DO issue. Um, we have had reports of dog illnesses on the Gualala, um, but that uh, was not confirmed. Um, we did get a confirmed dog death on the Trinity River that was attributed to uh, cyanobacteria exposure. Um, we did get reports of a human illness uh, this week on the South Fork Eel River, um, but that investigation is ongoing. Um, we'll be collecting samples uh, today and have talked with the local environmental health agency that will be posting caution signage out there. Um, and in other news, um, we are developing that North Coast benthic cyanobacteria monitoring report. Um, it's summarizing uh, data collected on the eel, South Fork eel and Russian river uh, through 2016 through 2019. Uh, and it includes a lot of data on benthic mat, water column, and spat samples. Uh, but a big component of that report, uh, we will be uh, recommending or providing monitoring recommendations on how to sample for benthic cyanobacteria. So stay tuned. Great, thank you very much. Uh, region two. If no one else is going, uh, Hal McLean from East Bay Parks here. Um, yeah, so uh, we had some presentations uh, earlier this year on uh, for the mitigation subcommittee committee about our Anza, Lake Anza hypogenetic oxygenation system. And we initially start off with problems and uh, we, we ended up uh, turning over the lake and getting a danger advisory immediately. And that finally cleared up in uh, June. Uh, but we've been having a hard time trying to keep the temperatures low and the oxygen high on that one. Uh, but we did end up canceling swimming because uh, we couldn't get, uh, we couldn't necessarily hire people when we were in a danger advisory. We didn't know when things were gonna change on that. Uh, similarly, we had, we've been at Lake Temescal in Oakland, we installed a nano bubbler, uh, which was undersized, but was doing well in the fall. Uh, it's having a hard time keeping up with the oxygen demand this summer, but we did do a PAC 27 treatment on uh, I think it was July 7th. And then on July 8th, we did an alum treatment and the lake has really cleared up a lot, but uh, we've had uh, E. coli issues, kind of chronic E. coli issues that we're trying to uh, solve and it is keeping swimming closed. Uh, both those, uh, and Temescal has, was at a um, caution and is now at a, a no advisories right now. Uh, Del Val was in a danger in April. Uh, it was downgraded to a caution in May. And uh, in June, we've taken down all advisories. We still see cyanobacteria, but none of the toxins. Shadow Cliffs uh, has been very good. Uh, no, no advisories, uh, but the water level has uh, sunk into a point where uh, we can't safely have swimming and we can't launch boats. So um, that's kind of rendered that recreational facility um, compromised. Uh, Quarry Lakes was at a danger in April and uh, a caution in June. And in Jul early July, we uh, have taken down all the advisories we still see cyanobacteria, but the toxin levels have been very low. And uh, we have opened Quarry Lakes to swimming, which is good. Uh, big breaks 
uh, was good up until June. And uh, we started seeing very small amounts of cyanobacteria. They were uh, microcystins, uh, microcystis with uh, a lot of microcystins. So um, it, it continues to be at a danger. And uh, uh, that's about it. If, any, if anybody has any questions, I can answer them. Great, thank you. Any questions for region two? Region three? Hi, this is Melissa Doherty from region three. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great, thanks. Yeah, um, our monitoring program is still kind of limited in the capacity for sampling, but we did participate in the two holiday or pre-holiday events. And so we were sampling four of our local lakes and so far we've recommended posting caution signs at a few of them, but mostly because of visual indicators, the toxin analysis actually came back below the thresholds that we typically use for um, requesting the lake managers to post. But just for public awareness, we've asked them to continue posting as long as those vi visual indicators are present and we will be participating in the, <clears throat> excuse me, the pre-Labor Day holiday is our next planned sampling event next month. So that's, pretty slow for region three this year. Any comments or questions, region three? Region four? We have someone on from region four. No one from region four? Okay, uh, moving on to region five. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, this is Karen Atkins from region five and um, lots of stuff going on in this region. Um, Clear Lake area and Lake Pillsbury area. We've gotten lots of um, human illness reports with some ER visits, trouble breathing um, and we have some danger warnings there. Um, I was told that someone else will give a more detailed update on that. So I'll leave more details for them. Um, moving on to the Delta area, there's lots of bloom reports from there. I think we got something like seven yesterday um, from the Delta area. Um, so there's microcystis blooms. You guys just heard a lot about the Stockton area, um, but lots of uh, fish and duck reports too for wildlife illnesses. Um, in addition to that, we recently did a tour of the Stockton waterfront with Restore the Delta um, and our water board member Firestone was there and we were able to tour uh, McLeod and uh, Mormon Slough, Smith Canal, those areas with her and she was very interested in what was going on there. Um, there's a lot of unhoused people in that area who have reportedly, um, are reportedly bathing in some of those um, troubled areas, so that's, that's not good. Um, in addition to that, there are some, um, we've been posting in that, uh, or signs are not posted yet, but um, we have caution and warnings there. Um, in addition to that, um, the Sacramento area, the ponds in local parks have had some issues. Um, apparently there are people recreating in those ponds um, and there have also been wildlife deaths reported um, in that area. Um, and then finally, in the southern region, there's uh, San Luis and Eastman Lake, um, as well as some of the southern rivers have also some cautions, um, such as the Merced and Tuolumne rivers. Um, yeah, that's what's going on. Great, thank you. Any questions or comments for Region 5? I have uh, Sarah Ryan's update uh, for Clear Lake. And I know we have Corolla and Angela too. Um, she mentioned they did the full routine um, uh, sampling event on July 14th. The results aren't back yet, um, but it's mostly Lambia dominated. Um, there are samples that were sent off for Microcystin toxin and QPCR, uh, QPCR for cylindrosporopsin and saxotoxin. 
my understanding is the last time they had like a lake wide lingual bloom was 2009, but um, Carol and Angela might have more. That is correct. That's about the time that the last large lingual bloom um, we had, and that was right at the beginning of a um, multi year drought as well. And then um, we also, I don't know if you, are you guys just doing bloom reports, but we have started an outreach kind of campaign to get people prepared for um, the, um, just the season and being aware of cyanobacteria. And we've actually been going around to the board of supervisors and count and city councils and doing a presentation with our public health department and with the tribes um, and our uh, water purveyor at our um, county special districts. Um, does the water treatment in Clear Lake, just to get people aware that we are talking and what our messaging is. And I have shared two of our example of our digital PSAs in the chat box. Um, and they're very simple, but they have phone numbers where to contact and basically making sure people are aware that there um, could be toxins in the lake and to think about before letting their dogs go swimming or their pets or their animals um, and also during recreation. So a uh, big change from before to, 2009, you mentioned um, when we had the last large lingvia bloom um, in the lake, uh, but just we're getting out in front of it and trying to get people aware of that um, instead of relying on, um, you know, reactive after we get a lot of reports and dog illnesses or dog deaths or anything like that. That's great. And, and Angela, you have some of that info up in the chat. So yeah, I put two up. of our um, digital, it's PDFs. Hopefully you guys can click on it. Um, uh, so these are digital ad campaigns. So we put them out on our Facebook. We bought a bunch of booths, thanks to our public health department. So it goes out into an area you can designate. Um, so our county uses Facebook a lot because that's how we communicate during fire events. Is, so we, everyone pretty much uses Facebook um, to get information. So sharing an ad through Facebook is really effective and it gets a lot, a lot of reach. And then we also did some other digital ads and so bought some time on some other sites like Newsweek and eBay when there's ads that pop up, you know, those things that we really are annoyed with, but now they have a public service uh, message uh, that hopefully is, is making the public aware. One thing that we were struggling with was we can have physical signage on the lake, but because a lot of the lake is privately owned, there's areas where we can't, can't put signage and private property owners or POAs or HOAs don't want signage up because they don't, you know, they don't want to discourage people from visiting here and spending money and tourists. Um, so one way you can get this information to people is through their cell phones and digital marketing. Um, so we're kind of trying it and see how it'll work this year. Um, but so far it looks successful. And the company we went through outside of Facebook, which has really good insights, but the company we went through for the digital marketing has a dashboard and I can check it every day, real time and see who is clicking on it. Are people reading the message? How often are they spending looking at it um, and get all those, those impact and those impact um, statistics to see if it's worth the money and what our, our reach is and how we can improve it for future years. That's great. That's, that's great information. Great for other people to, to hear. Thanks so much. Um, anything else for region five? Okay, Region 6, do we have somebody on? Hi everyone, this is Sabrina Rice. I'm from Region 6 and uh, Marissa covered a lot of what's been going on in our region already. So we had the special studies and the holiday assessments. Um, and then currently we have three advisories. They're just caution advisories due to visual indicators. Um, and that's at Bridgeport Reservoir, um, Silverwood Lake and Lake Gregory. And um, otherwise that's, that's about it right now. It's pretty slow. Great. Anything else, any comments or questions on region six? Okay, region seven. Hi, this is Jeff, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, um, first we're wrapping up a 12 month HAB characterization assessment that we started uh, in August of 2020 at the Worcester Wildlife Unit, which is a, um, it's kind of like a preserve, but it's also a hunting ground. Um, and then we're continuing to monitor water, scum, and algal mass at the Salton Sea, which is an ongoing monthly monitoring event. 
Um, and then finally, we recently kicked off our salt and sea benthic hab study. I've already talked about it in other groups. Uh, this comes after a, a confirmed dog death earlier this year. And uh, as, it, as Marissa mentioned earlier, uh, the sea is both hypersaline and hypereutrophic because it is a terminal lake. And even though we get non detects in the water column, uh, we're still getting simultaneous hits in the algal mats. So we're kind of tending to focus on the mats. The sea floor has a lot of fine sediments. It also has an extensive area of a gypsum crust that is formed there. Um, and both of these structures, eh, both of these substrates are covered in benthic mats and they frequently show the presence of cyanobacteria and some of the mats at times have shown the presence of four distinct cyanotoxins. So we're trying to determine the dominant toxin producers contained in the mats, figure out which varieties are responsible for the production and see if there's any physical characteristics associated with the various types of toxin producers, which we're hoping could provide a means for the public maybe to visualize um, potential toxic mats when they're uh, recreating. So that's, that's it. Great. Questions, comments for Region 7? Region 8. Hi, this is Katie from Region 8. Um, we've been focusing mostly on our special study projects at um, Lake Elsinore and Big Bear Lake. Um, we've been testing about uh, once to twice a month on those. Uh, they're both currently at a caution advisory and um, we are testing Lake Elsinore again tomorrow and Big Bear on Tuesday, I believe. Um, both have stayed in, within the caution advisories. Um, we've also received a report of fish kills at uh, Lake Evans that we sampled. Um, the results indicated um, caution levels and then um, anatoxin A, so it's currently at a caution advisory. And then um, we've also been working with San Bernardino County Parks for the holiday ass assessments. Um, and right now we don't have any advisories on their lakes. Any questions or comments on Region 8? Region 9. Hi, this is Carrie Nagoda from San Diego Region. Um, so we've been relatively um, had low numbers of any kind of re bloom reports, which is good news. Um, and then the satellite imagery, we've had just a few um, notifications that warranted further investigation. So I'd say our main um, lakes of interest right now are Lake Henshaw, which has pretty much been in bloom for over a year, um, unfortunately, and they've consistently had low levels of microcystins. Um, we've been able to take off um, any kind of warning signs um, for a little while, but now they're back up at a caution because there is anatoxin A being detected near their boat dock. Um, and so they're doing weekly sampling, sharing their information with us, which is great that they started their own program. Um, the other lake that we did have a caution after our July 4th sampling was uh, Lake Morena, and that was mostly due to visual. There were really high amounts of um, Plankothrix in our samples, but the toxin results came back not at um, the levels that we were expecting, but we still put the caution for that. Um, and other than that, we're focusing on our special study, which Marissa had already talked about, and that's a, a screening study in streams that are in high agricultural use um, watersheds. So far, um, it's been interesting. We have gotten some toxin hits on SPAT that we've been deploying, but um, we're about halfway through the study. So um, look for those results in a few months. Great questions for Carrie or Region 9 or comments. Right, then I think we're good. We are a little bit ahead of schedule. Uh, but uh, next up, we were going to get report from subcommittees. Oh, uh, David? Yes. This is, this is Hal McLean. You know, I, my coworker said that I misspoke. Uh, we do, we are at a caution at Del Val uh, right now. And we have been since June. And we, we, are, we also are continuing to have uh, to, to educate, but are still having issues with 
uh, our E. coli advisories and our HABs advisories and getting those messages clear to the public. So I just wanted to put that out there. Great, thank you. Any other comments or clarifications or anything anyone wants to add? We have a little bit of time. We could do something ungodly and actually get off a little bit early, but if people have comments. Oh, we still have the subcommittee updates too, right? Yes, oh yeah, no, yeah. We're, not, <laughs> we're not out yet. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> but I, I think we're ready to move on to those actually. So uh, subcommittee reports. Um, we have a number of subcommittees that um, have not been that active, but some that have. Um, and I guess we'll just go through those and, and see where we are. Um, Becky, do you want to do those in any particular order? No, whatever, whatever okay. you prefer. So let's see, uh, let's start with, uh, as listed on the web page, and I'm not completely clear that all of these are that active right now, but we'll go through them, see where we are. Is anyone on from the statewide guidance subcommittee? Um, Marissa, that has you if you're still on as, as a lead. I think Marissa had a conflict, so she hopped off. I know she's connected with other people, including me on that, and um, expect that this, maybe this fall that we'll be back um, active on a, on a few different topics that have come up. Okay. Um, Web Portal Architecture Subcommittee, has there been any activity on that one? I'll cover um, the spec again. I'll cover the um, ones that have come up through the the illness work group as far as the health pages that we update. Um, but I know um, Carly and Marissa and and Keith before um, have kept the um, the contacts, the agency contacts uh, updated. Um, and then I think we've already talked about the the update that was done on the response page. Great. Uh, education and fact, sheet, fact Sheets Committee, subcommittee. Anyone on from that one? Okay. Uh, monitoring and Assessment Committee. Protocol Development, SOPs. I don't think there has been any lead on that one for a while now, so I'm not sure that has had much activity, but please somebody speak out if you are on it and there's been something going on. Okay, uh, data subcommittee. Again, a Marissa Lee. On there, so I'm not exactly sure where we are with that. Uh, mitigation subcommittee, Hugh, are you on? Hugh Dalton, you're not on. Becky, have you tuned into that one recently? Uh, fairly recently. I don't know if Katie Katie is on either, but um, yes, how much and there's uh, been good talks on a couple of the different um, mitigations um, through East Bay Parks and um, one for uh, Elsinore, um, some of the sediment removal Anybody else that's been sitting on that has recollection of some of the other topics that have been present, presented on? I had one uh, with uh, vigorous epilimnetic uh, mixing with uh, Alex Horn. That was a good one. Very interesting approach. Okay, um, Wildlife Impacts Subcommittee. So I guess that's all kind of now under the illness work group. Um, we should probably get that um, that section updated as far as how we do subcommittees. But um, yeah, so um, can I share a screen a second, Dave? Absolutely. Okay, let's make sure I pick the right one. Are folks seeing that okay? Yes. 
Okay, great. So we um, put this page up, I think, two years ago. And so we've been trying to do um, generally annual updates to it. So it, it focuses on our, our illness work groups efforts and our illness tracking throughout California. This is a statewide effort for freshwater related um, um, uh, harmful algal bloom related illnesses. So we've updated that. It just went, the updates just went live, I think a week ago, maybe a little bit more. Um, so we added this, the graphic from the general awareness sign, just to kind of get a sense of that. Again, we've got um, potential symptoms and signs that are uh, possible. Um, information about how to report that. Again, we recommend um, doing the online bloom report form. I know people have mentioned how we've gotten um, cases in through that. Um, if it is a human illness, um, that the detailed information go, can go to CDPH uh, directly. And then we've got some general health information and more links to our different resources there. Again, this is an interagency group. So OWEHA, the Water Boards, Department of Public Health and CDFW are all represented on that. We also have a separate page on the marine hab related illness work that we've done. Um, and then one of the things that we've added in is we try to do annual summaries. So then this is just the new uh, edition of the 2020 data and we switched it to a graph instead of the table just for ease and visualization. Um, so again, these are the ones that um, uh, we receive in, we investigate um, as several of the regional hub coordinators mentioned, we work with them and the, um, the county uh, environmental and public health um, and connecting the environmental data and then what we learn about the illness um, through interviews uh, uh, for human or animal illnesses or what we obtain through working with um, CDFW in terms of fish and wildlife. And then so this graphic is specifically the ones that have been uh, considered um, have related um, for both our state tracking and what has been submitted to the CDC's One Health Harmful Algal Bloom System or OHABs. Um, so you can see um, for 2020, we had um, 10 dog cases that we reported. Uh, we haven't yet had a livestock case that's been reported um, in as HAB related. There's various reasons for that. Um, uh, we have wildlife and fish separately. Um, and then human cases, and then so you can see our, our total trend um, has been generally increasing in terms of what we've been reporting in. Uh, we've also done maps in terms of the counties in which these cases are reported. Um, so we've grouped it as, as human only, human and animal and animal only. Um, we've had, this was an existing figure for 2018 and 2019, and just be able to highlight the new data for 2020, we've got that as a separate map. Um, and then we've had this information too about how this is being rolled out um, across the US and um, uh, CDC did put together, um, did a summary of the 2016 to 2018 data. And so that's a set of reports and, and web-based um, documents as well as some supplemental tables and figures for those who are interested in more details. Um, so that's the update for that one. I also wanted to share if I can get to it. Sorry, sometimes the controls are a little challenging. Um, so we did do some updates as well to the dog and livestock page. So there were some additional um, symptoms included for CDC. So we wanted to make sure and we just generally say in terms of if there's anything kind of unexpected within a day or so of being in contact to water to let us know, we'll, we'll work through that investigation. There were some also additional resources and clarifications for the veterinarian resources that were included. Um, so we certainly welcome feedback on that. So just in, in general, wanted to let people know I'm looking for my notes. So from 2018 to 2020, um, and this was included in the legislative report. So again, um, what I showed earlier was the, the numbers that were reported as HAB related, um, but we also track the number of illness reports that we receive and spend time investigating. And so that has been a, between 40 and 49 per year for 2018 to 2020. And just some, for some perspective, we're already at 38 initial reports in for 2021. So we have been quite busy 
um, and appreciate everyone who's been involved in those in those efforts and helping support that. Um, and so we expect that that number will continue to grow as we go through um, the the summer season. And we certainly see that as as reports happening year round. Um, even as the the peak tends to be the the convergence of of more haves as well as more recreation, but we again see things um, even in, during uh, December January off season there. So um, I think I'll stop sharing. But if there's any questions, happy to answer them. Great questions for Becky. We good. Okay, um, then we have uh, the algal mat trigger levels group, which again, Marissa seems to be the lead on many of these, unfortunately not here. Um, anybody on that who has an update? Okay, and then we have long-term signage group in the HAB incident map group, which are really part of guidance. Any any up, uh, uh, updates or input on those? Okay. Um, this is Carly. Actually, I can speak to that for a moment. So we did, we're in the process of getting another contract. So we should have signage available for folks, as Marissa said, with the up and coming contract. And that's that corrugated um, four millimeter plastic. And then as well with the, um, have incident report map we're actually in the process of doing a pretty big revamp on the back end with the database um so you won't see many changes to the map but we'll be able to do a, quite a broader stroke and actually looking at some more details in, in terms of reporting out to folks on um when advisory change or grouping um different incidences into a case and things of that nature. So there's some cool stuff going on the back end that I just wanted to highlight for folks. Great. Anything else on any of the subcommittee work that anyone wants to weigh in on? Okay. Um, so we've set aside a little time here towards the end uh, for discussion of, of 2021 and, and forward. Uh, the schedule topics. Um, this is where if you have suggestions for either topics that you'd like to see covered or specific speakers for topics, uh, now would be a great time to hear about them. And, uh, and you can forward those to Sarah uh, or Becky or myself or all three of us. Um, we've heard, I think, a activity of some of the subcommittees, but clearly not of some of the subcommittees. And it may be time to talk about uh, maybe twilighting some of those uh, that exist and aren't being active or aren't, haven't been active. And, and perhaps there are new ideas on uh, where some of the subcommittee work should go. So this is a time for open discussion, comments, sharing your thoughts. So please uh, unmute yourselves, identify yourselves and throw your ideas out there. This is the time. Um, this is Peggy Lehman, and I think the work we've seen today is really uh, great. Uh, I would also like to see in the future some focus on mitigation. We got great monitoring program now, but the, what we really want to do is get rid of this thing. So I'd like to see more on that. Yeah, the, the I I would agree. The <clears throat> excuse me, the subcommittee on mitigation has been one of the more active ones. Uh, unfortunately, Hugh couldn't make it, I guess, today. But, um, you know, Hugh has taken over as, as the chair on that. And um, <clears throat> we've had quite a few good talks. I'm on that subcommittee as well, presentations. And I think some of those would be the right time for those to come forward and uh, maybe have more of those presentations and, and um, topics for discussion on that. Hi, Dave. This is uh, Jamie Smith from Squirp. Uh, I was curious about, um, and, and maybe Becky is a good person to speak to this, but I know that the ITRC has a, a Benthic Habs kind of working group theme 
um, for this most recent kind of cycle. And I was wondering if there's any interactions between that group and the CC Habs, kind of benthic Habs group that, that you mentioned, or the subcommittee that you mentioned. Um, well, we've certainly, I mean, the most active thing that for for California was the Benthic signage. And so I know for folks that are involved with that, we've definitely brought that in. I know we um, provided the um, the uh, external review on the last round. Um, I brought that forward, I think, both to the mitigation subcommittee as well as the Lyris list. Um, the next external review for this, specifically the Benthic group, will be in, I should know this off the top of my head, September. Um, so I can distribute that as, as well. Um, I think that'll be a 30 to 45 day um, period um, to get feedback in. Um, so that'll be great. And then I was really interested to hear from Mike Thomas about the, the report that the North Coast uh, region is doing. And it'll be really interesting to see that as well. Um, and I also think it's been interesting to see now with uh, um, the bioassessment uh, collaboration as far as getting those samples in and, and getting those in dry weight and, and doing that comparison to the OEHA um, dog and livestock uh, benchmarks has been interesting to to see that and, and getting hits there as well. But yeah, it's a, it's a good point. Um, and we certainly tried to bring bring folks in that have been involved. It seems, Becky, like there has been some overlap between a number of the people in California interested in, in Benta Cabs and that ITRC group that is, aren't, I mean, you are involved in that. Isn't Keith involved in that as well and a few other people? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> We try not to overwhelm the group, but yes, we're involved. <laughs> well, if you're leading the pack, that's not overwhelming, I think. <laughs> Keith, do you want to add anything on that? Oop, we may have lost Keith. Yeah, I no longer see him on the, the list, so he may have signed off. Okay, other, uh, other comments, suggestions, topics? This is, this is Hal McLean, East Bay Parks. Um, I kind of have reached out a little bit to the Inland Swimming Group uh, about uh, HABs, and I think that they could use a bigger presence uh, of cyanobacteria folks. I mean, they're more in the E. coli, in the e. coli realm. And like, like I was said earlier, our... Our, our signage gets really complicated when you have E. coli advisories and HAB advisories and swimmer's itch advisories. <laughs> and so uh, I guess it means don't go in the water if you have all those, but, but I mean, it, it would be good to have like more, um, maybe a more combined uh, effort uh, to come up with some good messaging and some good uh, signage for California recreators. So how are you thinking maybe um, a way of starting that interaction would be to bring in one or more of them to give uh, presentations on what they do and how they do it um, with the idea of some cross fertilization there? Yeah, I mean, I think they're uh, uh, they're kind of a little bit more in their infancy as well. I mean, they're still deciding certain things, uh, but, and, and I, I, I haven't been to the, the last meeting, but um, yeah, I think we definitely, uh, maybe we could do a presentation in their uh, group and they can do a presentation in our group and we could definitely get some uh, brainstorming and some, you know, ideas because you know, the presentations today were really great and they really fostered some great conversation. And uh, I think, uh, you know, I think that's that's uh, a need for the for the state. Yeah, yeah. If, if you have connections there um, or, you know, contacts that you know of, uh, please send them on and and uh, we'd be happy, I think, to, to start those interactions off in a more formal way. I mean, this was my idea of uh, I was very interested to hear 
uh, from Marissa what the connectivity is or will be with uh, fish and wildlife. Um, you know, and, and I've already got a note here to, to contact Jenna because I think that is also something where the groups, the different approaches and um, you know, atmospheres, whatever, goals, missions uh, can help each other. So, so I think it would be great to foster those with the Inland Swimming Group as well. Hi, David, this is Leslie Choate with Sonoma County um, Environmental Health. Um, I, I completely agree with that. We had a big meeting with our parks department and there, um, it was expressed that we would like to have better educational signs um, that are the overarching, um, not just related to uh, cyanobacteria, but you know, um, E. coli and all sorts of things and, and have, have something at each of our beaches that people can make informed decisions. Um, so I agree with that wholeheartedly, thinking about this on a, a greater level, that, that people are well educated. And we've have already had some problems, Irma Russian River, with E. coli and um, um, cyanobacteria, obviously. And it, and it seems to be, pro, you know, it, it is prevalent throughout uh, California. So just wanted to chime in on that. Other comments, suggestions? Hi, David, this is Jetta. Um, I guess just to wanna throw out there that some discussions that I've had with um, Carly and Marissa is, so my background's primarily in the San Francisco estuary. I've done a lot of environmental monitoring there. And something that I've been considering kind of targeting first is more coordination in that region. Um, you know, like as today we've learned, there's so many great efforts going on, but I'm not sure, um, I've been debating about creating like a project work team, whether um, in the interagency ecological program, or maybe it's more relevant to have a work team part of CC HABs, but um, I kind of, one of my, what I'm thinking is it might be interesting is kind of knowing like what's going on, who are the key players. And then after kind of knowing everything we know, kind of get tap into what Peggy was saying is, okay, how do we mitigate it? Like, I think we're doing a lot of great work, but what do we know? And then what are some options for us to start conquering this and maybe who, who's responsible for that? Or, you know, um, just throwing that out there, that's kind of an effort that I'm thinking about starting no promises, of course, because it's a big effort, but um, just throwing that idea out there. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I think we are getting to the point where everybody has the M word on their lips, mitigation. Um, and uh, I mean, I have very strong feelings about this myself, having dealt with um, some who I would say are not using the, the most avant-garde of techniques, um, i.e. ancient and often dirty. Um, there are good techniques that are out there. There are some that are way better than others. I think it's probably, and we just heard this earlier in the first comment um, by, by Peggy, we really want to start focusing uh, on mitigative approaches, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it, which there are all three of those, unfortunately, associated with many of the techniques. But I think that is something that everyone uh, would, would like to move towards. I think the, and we heard this a little bit from Marissa, you know, it's been quite some time just to get to the point where we are really thinking seriously about wide scale monitoring. We, you can't really figure out how to fix a problem until you know what the magnitude of it is. Uh, but I think we're getting to that point. I really am pleased about the FHABs program or its new incantation. And, uh, and I think that is getting us to the point where we need to next start thinking about how do we mitigate and ultimately how do we manage to avoid the need for mitigation? Um, so I, I think those, those are all good ideas. They yeah, abso kind of absolutely. And um, the only thing I guess I was gonna say is um, since I have like my network so far in the Delta, that's what we're kind of brainstorming is maybe we could use the Delta as a pilot for kind of trying to figure out some mitigation efforts or what's going on and then kind of use it as a lessons learned to either expand to the, the Bay or other statewide areas. So 
um, that's something I'm interested in and we'll see, see how it goes. I'm a team of one at CDFW right now, so we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least there won't be many arguments then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Dave, I would just bring up though, one, one thing we haven't, hasn't explicitly come up in that conversation is if you, if you look at the budget states like New York or Florida or um, some of the other ones that have a lot of mitigation, it's a multi-million, hundreds of million dollars a year committed. So I think, you know, that's that's something to, to keep on the radar and I, I know is, is something people are hoping for, but I think I think with without the you know budget to go along with it, we can we could say the M word, but actually doing it is an expensive business. So No disagreement in terms of costs. Um, I mean, these are problems that have re result or have been created over decades. Eutrophication isn't something that typically happens yesterday. Um, by the same token, the fixes are not going to be simple. Um, I, I generally separate mitigation from management uh, and prevention. Uh, mitigation is if you have a problem, you basically need to hit it now. And it's not always the best approach. And, and it often isn't anything that will get you closer to prevention, but management. So I do think those come hand in hand and you have to, you have to move forward agreed with you know, the economic reality of what these things will cost. And that's dependent totally on the system, how big it is, how big the problem is, who's responsible, how easy it will be to grapple with the causes and the, the stimulus for blooms, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we're getting to the point where we're talking about these things now. I agree with it. It's going to cost us a whole lot. But when you consider the last last year, we were up to a thousand micrograms per liter of toxins in the Stockton Ship Channel area, and they couldn't do any recreational activities or boating activities. We're talking a lot of money, and when you consider the fact that this is water, it eventually goes down to, to Southern California at 25 million people. Um, it really isn't that expensive when you consider the impact. That's kind of my thinking. Okay, glass half full, glass half empty. Uh, <laughs> other, I, I agree. I, I think you know the cost. You pay the cost one way or the other. You pay the cost either outright to fix your problem, to manage your, your water body, or you pay the cost in, in human and animal sickness, um, in contaminating and, and using a water supply that is, is at best qualified. Um, I, I think you pay either way, uh, but this is, this is something that is unavoidable, I think. Other comments, other topics? Everybody ready to sign off? Peggy, did you have another comment? No? OK, anyone else have anything to add before we wrap up? OK, busy season, busy year. Uh, warm, hot, dry year uh, is uh, not helpful to what we try to prevent. And, and deal with, um, but that is the way it is. Um, thank you all for the great reports. Thank you, Marissa and, and Ellen uh, and, and Tim for, for the uh, great presentations. And um, we will be back in touch again for the next quarterly. Thanks, Dave. Okay, thank all, you. you bet, we'll see you. Thanks everyone.